Okay, so questions tonight. As we're going through this, I got a lot to cover, uh, a lot of detail. And I know that when I'm doing this in the live environment, people are asking a lot of questions before I even get to answering that, uh, which I know is going to happen here as well. So what I want you guys to do is, and the nice thing about here is you can start typing in your questions. I am not going to stop and read your questions while I'm doing the presentation. Uh, it's hard enough for me to read the questions, okay? So but what I want you to do is go ahead and start putting in the questions. You can start typing them, um, maybe even wait a little bit just to make sure I'm gonna answer some of them. But if you know I skipped over something or if I talked about a particular part of the, the land trust, and I moved on to a different, a different aspect of it. That's the time to type in your questions. And I will come back to them after we get through all this. Then I can go through and focus on reading what your questions were. Uh, and probably what I'll do at that point is I will find you in the, the list, the attendance list. And I'll unmute you. And you can ask your questions. Because I, I, I know a lot of times people can't quite type in the question you know, when they're typing it to a way that I'm gonna be able to understand it the way you want me to understand it. So I found it's best if I can do that. So we're gonna try that tonight. Like I said, this is an experiment with this many people on a webinar, but we're gonna do our best. So if you guys can type in your questions, go ahead and do that. And don't worry, I'm not gonna avoid them. I'm not gonna ignore them. I will get to them later on. Uh, my goal is to try to get us out of here. To, you know, I think we can get done probably in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes tonight, but we'll see. Uh, I do have a lot of co lot to cover, uh, but if you have a lot, of, a lot of questions later on, then we might stick on for a lot longer. We'll see. I don't, I don't know how it's going to go. So land trust, and this is something that I talk about, I'm talking about frequently, and I, I know investors talk about all the time. But I've also found out, well, this is one of the most talked about topics. It's one of the least used things. So a ton of people talk about them but they don't use them. Case in point, I was talking to a, an experienced investor this afternoon who's been around for a long time. And he said, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm definitely gonna be on the call tonight. He says, because while I've been doing this business for a long time, I have, and I know trust, I've heard you talk about them a half a dozen times. I've been to other investors, uh, training classes, they've talked about them um, then. He said, but I've never used them. But it's getting to a point now that the way the market's going to be changing, I might be doing some more sub twos and more creative stuff. And that's the type of stuff that we want to put into a trust. Uh, I am seeing a couple people saying that they're having audio um, problems. Uh, if you, one of the things we've experienced, if, if you're having audio problems, uh, first of all, we are recording this. So if you do completely lose the audio or for whatever reason you get dropped out, you can come back and listen to this. So I'll have it uploaded to the Minria site tomorrow, uh, by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, usually if you just go into the site and go to the event, so calendar and then, then today's event. So you gotta navigate to that. On the bottom of the page, you'll find the replay. Um, so usually we do audio, but because this one's gonna be a webinar, I'm just recording the webinar, better make sure I got the recorder going. Yes, recorder is going, so it is recording. I'll get that uploaded. Uh, one of the things, and I've been doing all webinars for a very, very long time, and what I found with most people when they say they're having problems with the audio, it's it's usually a technical problem on be somewhere between your end and your internet, uh, and and I know that because this be recording is being done through the Go to Webinar platform, and usually when people are saying it's cutting out, we go listen to the recording. It's not. So I just know that from years of experience doing this, it's usually going to be on your end. Sometimes, you know, your, your processor is backed up doing other things. Um, here on my system, I have a high performance system and our internet here is super mega fast. I pay for really high internet because we do do a lot of audio and video uh, processing here at our office. Uh, that I, I, it's generally not that case. Uh, once in a while it will be. But if I hear, I mean, most people are coming back saying, hey, I hear you just fine, Mike. So that's usually the case. I'm going to apologize up front for people who are having problems hearing right now if it's getting choppy. Uh, video will get choppy. I mean, a lot of times you'll see the slide. I'll change the slide on here and I'll be talking about it. But there is a video leg or it, and then it'll be a moment or so later than yours will change. Um, so if you've never been on a webinar like this before, those are some of the things just keep in mind but we will do our best to get through this tonight for you guys. And hopefully within another month, we can get back to live events, which is 
the preferred method for me and I'm assuming most people as well. All right, so I want to start out with, let's look at just an idea of if you've seen the cars that drive around town that says we buy houses. Uh, I'm assuming most of you have seen them. I know several people on here, I've, when I was scrolling through the list earlier to see who's on here, I know have them on their vehicles. Um, I have had them on all mine in the past. Uh, I just got a new truck last year. I haven't put it on there yet, but I've been thinking about it. I'm going to get it put on there. I just made the decision last week. I'm going to go put them on. And in fact, this week, I'm going to probably go out and start putting out some bandit signs because the weather's getting really nice. Uh, and so for those of you who are asking, no, I'm not putting me by houses on the bike. Uh, so the motorcycle is off limits when it comes to that. However, I have thought about it, but I've made that decision. The vehicle, the car, yes. Four wheels, yes. Two wheels, no. So, but, so you've seen the signs, we buy houses. I mean, that'd be a number. But could you imagine somebody driving around with this on their vehicle? Basically say, hey, this is my financial statement. Here's my net worth, right? I don't think anybody would ever do this uh, and just drive around town advertising their net worth. Yet the, the problem is, is most people are doing that, but they're not putting it out on print, but they're, they're, they're expressing it in other ways, in verbal and nonverbal ways that, hey, I, I'm a landlord or I'm an investor and I have money and blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of the people have a bunch of tenants and their tenants all know about all your other properties. You're letting everyone know that you have a large net worth. So having your properties unprotected is the worst thing you can do as an investor down the long run. Once you've built some wealth, you want to be able to protect it. So we, that's what we want to talk about. And that's what land trust is all about is, is it's part of our asset protection. So there's really four levels of asset protection. Uh, and they, they start out in the manner of most people are familiar with LLCs and corporations, right? Because that's what most of us have is, an, is either an LLC or a corporation, or we have a combination of both, all right? And then the next level that people always say is liability insurance, okay? So I'll just have some liability insurance. And for most people, this is what they, this is where they stop. So I, I talk about trust and then they go to an attorney and they ask their attorneys, what should I do? Well, all you need is an LLC and a liability insurance policy and you are fine. You don't have to worry about it. If you got sued, don't worry about it. Cause you know what? You've also got me and I will defend you if somebody was to come after you. Right. And that's most people's plan. And in fact, that's what the attorneys try to advise you to do too. Uh, one, because they make more money on the LLCs. Um, but once I'm done with you guys, you're going to understand that we're still going to use the LLCs. We're just going to use it in a different way. Uh, the Most attorneys don't like land trust because of the anonymity that it provides and it makes it harder for them to do their work. The good attorneys really understand this and they're, they work with their clients the right way. Right. But they're, they also need to be trained as well. And so this, but this is most people's plan right here. They have an LLC, they're going to get some liability insurance. And if they get sued, they're going to default to their, their attorney, which by the way, is the most expensive form of asset protection. Uh, and it, they, if you've got a good attorney, it generally will work. And it's just going to be very expensive to do so. Well, when it comes to, to my perception of asset protection is the biggest one is privacy. Right, so if I can keep it private where nobody can even find what my assets are, then it's it's just that much better. I don't have to worry about somebody trying to come after my assets as if I'm keeping them private and nobody can see them. Right, and the way we're going to do that is from tr with trusts. And there's two types of trust. There's a land trust and then there's a personal property trust. Okay, so the land trust is designed to hold real estate, re uh, real property. Whereas the personal property trust is designed to hold other things, anything that's not real estate. Uh, like for example, the most common one is vehicles. So cars, um, boats, RVs, that kind of thing. Those are in a lot are going to be in trust. So like I have, I have all my real estate in land trust and I have all my vehicles, anything that has a tire on it or an engine on it that I have hold a title to is in a personal property trust. All right. And so we'll, I'm going to focus tonight, though, on the land trust. The personal property trust is just a very simple version of a land trust. Once you understand the whole concept of trust, then the personal property trust will make sense as well. And they're actually easier to work with than the land trust because we're not having to deal with the, the real estate itself. Okay. Uh, but there is a complication when it comes to personal property trust for vehicles. 
and that's dealing with the DMVs. Um, there's a few DMVs around the cities that I know work very well with them. The rest of them, you have to educate them because they're not they don't they're not dealing with trust all the time, so they don't know how to deal with them. And the the default answer is always, well, you can't do that. But the real answer is yes, you can. We just have to help them learn how to do it. Okay. So what is a trust? All right. It is a form of an asset protection entity. Okay. And it's a basically it's a protection tool. Okay. All right. It's one of the oldest forms of an entity ever created. And they were first used in English and Spanish merchant merchant ships. Uh, and I, I don't remember when I learned these, and I'm starting to forget the dates, but I want to say like in the 1500s, maybe the 1600s is when they were first starting to be used. And the, the, the reason why they were created in the first place is because back in the, the day when the, the Spanish and the, and the English were exploring and trying to find better trade routes and trying to find, you know, all kinds of different ways around they would sometimes you know either one be um i'm trying to find the right the right term um pirates that's the term they would be taken over by pirates or they would go down in storms right well then they would lose all the assets well back in those days most of the the people who were investing these were the the dukes and the earls and the people who owned the land and the people who are working on them were you know like I don't know the right term, like in the movies they call them peasants. I don't know if that's what they really were. But you know, the men would go work on the ships. And if the ship went down, the there was nobody to take care of the family, but the family still lived on the, the owner's land. Right. So people would go after them and say, okay, well, because my husband went, you know, died from the going down on the ship or I never returned or whatever, you have to take care of me. So they what they want to do is figure out a way to still invest in these merchant ships without having to be responsibility, the, the responsibility or the liability to the errors if something happened, right? So they were willing to lose their investment, but they didn't want to have to pay for it for the rest of their lives on top of it because they, the ship went down. So that's where they created the, the, the trust and that provided them the protection or the privacy. So really nobody knew who owned those ships, right? The beneficiaries knew who they were, but nobody other than the beneficiaries knew who owned those ships. So if they went down, they didn't know who to go after. Right. It's the best tool for process, passing your assets to your heirs, primarily because it avoids probate. Uh, and if you, if you understand the, the importance of that, if you don't understand the importance of it, just look at Prince's estate. Um, Prince's estate right now, because he did not have a will and he didn't have anything in trust, he probably figured he was gonna live forever. But when he died, his his uh, whole estate is being probated. They figure that thing's going to take 10 years to probate that estate. And by the time it's all said and done, the only one they're going to have any money out of it are the lawyers because they're going to make a fortune out of this probating his estate. It's been going on for a few years already. And it and, and when I heard the initial estimates from some of the uh, experts out there, there's like it's going to be at least 10 years. And the only one's going to make any profit or get any assets out of it is going to be the attorneys during that 10 year time frame while the whole state's being probated. So tool, a trust is a great tool to pass your assets to your heirs and completely avoid probate. Even if you have will and all your stuff is in wills, the wills can still be contested and probated. All right. So a trust though doesn't because a trust doesn't die. It's an entity. It doesn't die. And so once they're structured properly, the benefits, the benefits of the trust will just transfer to whoever you want it to transfer to based on you've got however you've got it set up. And those are the types of things we'll we'll talk about when we get into the, uh, the more the transferring your ownership or your beneficiary and how to do all that stuff. We talk about that in a class. Tonight, my main goal is to open up your guys' minds about what a trust is and how to use them. And, and one of the things too, and as well while we're going before I get too deep into this. Trusts are, they're the, the best tool to use, but they're the most confusing thing to learn because they're so simple. They're so simple that most people just can't wrap their mind around how simple they really are. Once you understand them, how to use them, what the costs are, all that stuff, 
So I had to, and I pick up everything quickly myself. I had to hear it three or four times before I finally said, you know what, I'm just going to give it a try. And once I tried, I'm like, oh, wow, it really is that easy. Okay. Uh, so much so I even went in, uh, I think I'm probably the only person right now alive that has done a trust in Canada in the last 50 years, at least in the last 20 or 30 years anyways. Because um, I did spend some time in Canada for a while. And I, when I bought my first property out there, I wanted to put it in a trust. And I went and did the research. And I was no, no, you can't do that. And Canada, I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because I know the laws. I know it's based on old English common law. Canada is more English than the United States is. Um, so this doesn't make any sense. And so I went and researched and researched. And I talked to all the speakers and the trainers who teach this stuff in the States. And they're all like, I know you can do it because there's no, there's nothing that says you can't do it in Canada, but I don't know anybody that's actually done it. I'm like, well, I'm going to go figure it out. And I just started calling and calling and calling until finally somebody put me in touch with an old attorney who was retired, but he remembers doing trust when he was in his early days, He's, but they just kind of faded away in Canada. He said uh, probably about, you know, this was 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now. And he said they faded away about 20 or 30 years ago. He says, he was so happy that I was asking him about trust that he came out of retirement to do this property and put it in the trust for me. And when we get all done, I'm like, oh, there's absolutely zero difference on how to do it in, in Canada than there was in the US. They're identical and right down to the exact same forms. I didn't even need a different form, which is what I was looking for because I figured I needed a different form in Canada. Didn't even need a different form, right? It's, it, and it's that common, but they're are uncommon around the world. But here in the States, they're very, very popular in a certain class of people, right? the wealthy, the, the people who have assets, and anybody in a government agency, or I shouldn't say government agency, anybody in politics. So if you got, I mean, politicians are the biggest hypocrites because they, they, they can stand up on stage and say, you know, the, the evil rich, well, they're the ones that own all the stuff. You're never going to find it because they have it all in trust. In fact, I know I've talked to uh, friends that have gone through that have been congressmen and when at the federal level. And one of the things when they, the congressman freshman year, they go through training. And one of the training is if you're, if you play ball with them, they'll put you into the right training, which will teach you how to hide your assets. And they teach you how to put everything into trusts. Right. And so that's what most of them do. All right. And where did they start in the States? Okay. Well, they started using them in Illinois in 1868. And the first case to recognize them as a, as a valid instrument for owning property was in Illinois uh, in 1920. It was a case called Kerr versus Cotts. Right? So that, I'm assuming you can probably even look that up online right now. Right? That's the first case where the, the courts in the United States ruled it as an entity for holding title. All right. So the Illinois courts held it up in, as a legal manner. And what they said is, in essence, a land trust is a simple trust which vests in a trustee the title to the property and the power to convey or deal with the property at the direction of the trust beneficiary. So keep that in mind, the trust beneficiary, and keep this whole section here with at the direction of the trust beneficiary. This is going to come in play in a little while. We're going to talk about some, um, some statutes, uh, some legal things. So keep this in mind because there are some people out there that say you can't do trust and they're going to be pointing back to this clause here. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to get you to understand a little bit more about trust before we get too deep into the weeds. OK. All right. So why use a land trust? Well, the primary one and the biggest one for me is the privacy and it keeps your name off of public records. Those are the most important aspects of it, the privacy and keeps your name off of public records. And I can't emphasize the importance of this more but the time frame we're coming into right now is going to be very, very evident. Uh, and I can just, I can share a couple of quick stories as to where this is really going to come into effect without you even knowing about it. Um, back in the day, I used to be a trustee for another gentleman. And this is early days. He was my trustee. I was his trustee. And he had uh, been doing, he had done a rehab. And he had hired this kid that he kept firing the kid and then hired him. He'd fire him because the kid was always doing work and he was either drunk or stoned. Or he was, you know, suffering from a hangover and didn't show up. 
But when the kid was sober, he was a really good worker and he would work really cheap so they can get beer that next night. Well, this investor kept rehiring him, even though he shouldn't have, but he kept rehiring him. Well, this kid knew where all of his rental properties were and he knew where his, his rehabs that he had been working on. So one day he rehired him back up to do some work on a roof on a property on one of his rehab projects. He was up on the roof doing some work. He was stoned out of his mind, probably stoned and drunk. Tumbled, fell off the roof, landed on his shoulder and broke his collar, his shoulder, um, the clavicle bone up there. So he didn't have insurance. The investor didn't have insurance. So he went to the hospital, got taken care of, but obviously he couldn't work and he was out of work. So he proceeded to sue the investor. Well, I was a trustee on the property and the investor at the time was on vacation with his family. And so I got the call from the attorney on that as a trustee. And the attorney asked, well, you know, asked me about the property. And the, the attorney didn't know all the, the right answers and all that stuff, but he was, are the right questions. But he was asking the questions as best as he could because he wasn't adept with trust. All right. So he was asking all the wrong questions. He was like asking, well, you own the property. Well, no, I don't. Well, who owns the property? Well, you know who owns it. You got the name of the trust. No, I need to know who owns the trust. I'm like, well, you, I can't tell you who owns the trust, but I'm the trustee. I'm the one you have to deal with. Anyway, so we went back and forth for a little while. Long story short, the investor was out of uh, vacation, so I and he was out of the country. Uh, I think he was in Mexico. So I figured, well, I'll tell him when he comes back. But when he came back, the property was all renovated, and you know, this is like a week and a half to two weeks later. And I completely forgot about it, blew it off. You know, I knew it was no big deal. And we go to closing because he calls me up, and as a trustee, I have to go to closing with him. And he says, and we're at closing. I'm like, oh, by the way, whatever happened with that lawsuit? And he's like, what lawsuit? I'm like, you know, that one where so-and-so fell off the roof? You go, yeah, he's suing. The, he, he was coming after the property. Goes, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about it. Okay. That's the last conversation we ever had on it, ever. And this is, well, I'm talking 20 years later. We've never even talked about it since. And other than when I share the story, half the time he's in the audience and he comes up to me afterwards and we laugh about the story because right? he's been a Minria member for most of this time, All right? So that's one of them. And it didn't happen because the kid probably went to the attorney thinking that he, because he knew where all these properties were. And the attorney could look them all up. He found all the addresses, but he found they were all in trust. I was the trustee on all the properties, but they were going after him on a specific property. But the attorney probably went back to the kid and says, well, yeah, I can come after him. We probably got a good case, but I'm going to need to get a retainer fee up front. Now, if we hit, and so the kid probably didn't have the retainer fee for the, so the case dropped. If, if this investor had all the properties in his name, they for sure would have filed a lawsuit. They would have gotten an injunction on all of his properties. That would have put a stop to all the, the work that he was doing on the properties. He wouldn't have been able to sell anything. He wouldn't have buy anything. He wouldn't have been, his business would have been done until this was dealt with. So that's one of the benefits there. Another one is um, about, you know, a little, little bit before the market crash in 2008, there was a scandal of the, the equity stripping. And there was another investor that him and I had both had a bunch of properties in the same areas. We'd known each other for a long time. Uh, I had all mine in trust. He did not have his in trust. I think we both had roughly around the same properties, maybe 30 or 40 properties at the time, all in the same areas. Right? And this equity stripping, and, and there were some people that actually got in trouble and because they were doing some fraudulent activities. This other investor wasn't doing anything fraudulent. He was doing the exact same as me, but we were buying property subject to's and we and are not subject to it. Then we were doing, buying them and selling them, on, buying them on lease options and selling them on lease options. But yeah, we probably were doing subject to's by then. I think we, I came after that time frame. I can't remember exactly when we started doing them. No, and we, I'm, I'm sure we were doing them at that time. So, anyways, uh, 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 and a, uh, a journalist at the Star Tribune wanted to make a name for himself. So he went to he went and found this investor. I don't know how he found him, but he found him. Did a title search on asset search, found all his rental properties. Went and knocked on the door of all his land of his tenants, and got all of his tenants convinced that they were equity stripped. And because we sold them all on lease with the option to buy, that they were um, uh, victims of equity stripping by this investor. So this journalist wrote up all these articles. He got on the first page on one one day on a Sunday. He got on the first page front page news. It was on the bottom of the pool, but it was front page news. He was probably three or four times over the course of several months. 
And I'd even contacted a friend at the attorney general office and said, are you guys even investigating this guy? Like, yeah, his name came up across our radar. We checked him out, but there's no evidence that he was doing anything wrong. So no, we we're not, he doesn't have an open case on him. And they're like, I, I would tell you if we, if we did. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I went and even told the investor that I'm like, I even checked on it for you because I knew he was not doing it. He had three heart attacks in that time frame. In a, in a two year period, he had three heart attacks and it was all stress related over that situation. Uh, and his tenants, he started losing tenants. And this is before the market even crashed. He started losing tenants, all that stuff. Me, on the other hand, never got written up, never got questioned. None of my tenants were ever talked to because nobody could find them. That in fact, that journalist, if my, my name would have been on the properties, he would have found them or he probably found that they were in trust, didn't know who to go after. So he never came after me. Whereas the other investor had three heart attacks in about a, I think about a two year time frame over that because of the stress. So it's what you don't know that is going to be beneficial to you with the trust. It's the things that you, protects you from that you'll never even know about. That to me is the biggest thing. All right. So let's talk about what happens when you find a good investment property. What's the next? Typically, you're going to take title and most people take title in your own name. Now, let's have a quick conversation about this for our beginners out there. Right now, I'm talking about an advanced asset protection um, tool, but I know we got a lot of beginners out there right now, and I hear this all the time from beginners like, I've been studying and I've been learning, and this is my next step. This is, and I'll be ready to start once I get a LLC formed because everyone tells me I need an LLC before I get into business. No, you do not need an LLC, and I can I can guarantee you. In fact, I'm looking right now, I'm looking at the list of attendees in here because I know most of the names. Maybe not now. I was going to say most of them, but now that I'm looking through, I don't know most of these people. But a lot of the people, I know several people I can see right now that I know they have a bunch of inventory. They have a bunch of properties and they have them in their own name right now. And they've been in this business for a long time and they've been just fine. Right? It, it, I'm not saying that you have to have a company or an LLC or a trust. This is more advanced. I don't want you to learn this stuff and wait to go do some deals. There's some great deals that are gonna be coming out right now. Um, I want you guys to just get out there and start doing this and use your own name. Don't worry about this stuff until you've done a few deals, then come back in. Right now, I just want you to understand that this is available for you guys, right? So I don't want you to think that. I just wanna get that out there because I hear all the time people say, what's holding them back is they haven't started, they haven't formed a company. You can do this in your own name. I don't recommend doing it forever in your own name, but do your first couple of deals in your own name. You're not a target. Nobody's got anything to come after you for at this point because you're not, you haven't been out around long enough. It's once you've been around for a while and, and start building up some assets. And it's really what it, where it's most important is once you start building, you know, paying down some debt where you start getting some equity in there. That's where the real problems come in for investors is because they got their equity and now their, their livelihood and their income is tied up on the stuff. So if you're just starting, don't worry about this stuff. Just do it in your own name. Learn this stuff later, all right? But you still need to hear it three, four times before it's going to make any sense to most people. Uh, like the other one, he said, I've heard you say it six, half dozen times, and I've probably heard another six other um, investors or uh, trainers from going to other training courses. He says, I know I need to do them. Uh, and he says, I think I'm going to start now. I'm like, well, better late than never. All right, so you got to, everyone's got to start at some time, but you got to start somewhere. Right now, start in your own name, but everyone else, start looking at this and start considering using trust. And for those who've been around for a little while and you've been saying, you know, it's time to do it, now is the time to start doing it. So I'm here to help you guys learn how to do that. Okay, what's going on here? All right, so the next thing, the natural progression is, Maybe you do a deal or two in your own name, but say, okay, now I'm, I know what I need doing. I need to get an LLC or a corporation. Uh, and it doesn't really matter at this point whether it's an LLC or a corporation. For the, this purposes, it, they're the exact same thing, right? The, the, it, it's an entity. It's a legally formed entity. And it's going to give you some liability protection. Not as much as most people think, though, which is why everyone recommends getting a liability insurance policy. And again, like I was saying earlier, most people, this is where they start. They, they get an LLC and then they get a liability policy, like an umbrella policy, because they say, you know what? even if I do get sued, the liability insurance will cover me. Well, liability insurance may not cover you for everything like you think it will. 
Uh, in fact, the things that are the scariest are probably the things that you know the, uh, the liability insurance is not going to cover you for. But I would rather have a privacy so they don't have to get to that point. All right. With that said, I have an LLC. I have S Corp, I have LLC, and I have liability protection. All of that, I'm not saying we don't do that stuff. We still do that, but you're going to understand why we, how we do it in just a little bit. We're going to add a little extra layer of protection. But this is the way most people do things. And then their backup is a good defense attorney. All right. And, and that's the expensive part. Um, and actually, and if, I don't know. I know several people already have Legal Shield. If you don't have Legal Shield, come talk to me. Um, I might even try to get um, some time here in one of these days and, and do a presentation on, on the Legal Shield because they have a great defense plan already structured for investors, uh, which actually saved my butt uh, twice over the years. Not in big ways. I mean, I haven't been sued big time, but small little things that have come along. And yeah, it's definitely worth it. Um, like I have 60 hours worth of uh, trial defense time already banged up, right? So if you're curious about it and you want to know some more, I'm out here talking about that, but just get a hold of me and we'll we'll talk about it. If we get enough interest, I'll, I'll schedule a time and maybe even get uh, an expert in on talk about that, what it is and, and how it's going to benefit us as investors. All right, so let's, most people are going to do that one and not use their own name. So if we had our choice between LLC, corporation, our own name, I'm assuming everyone understands. Go with the corporation, don't use your own name. But like I said earlier, for the beginners, just put everything in your own name until you've done this. All right. I've done it, I bought one or two deals and you start, and then take your the money and some of your proceeds and start paying from some of that education. Maybe do a wholesale deal. And then when I get this land trust class, this one day workshop land trust class set up, then pay the money and come to that class. Cause that's not a free class. I don't do that one for free. I mean, we literally spend a full day going through, we recap this stuff, but then we go into the nitty gritty and we talk about the dirt, you know, the down and dirty details about the trust and all the little nuances within how to set them up and how to create the beneficiaries and the trust and using other entities to become the beneficiaries and all that. We get, we go deep into the trust in this training class. All right. So, and that's where I use the trust and, and this is where I want to try to get as many people as possible using the trust. And I know more and more people are using trust these days. Um, it, it's, it's really heartwarming when I go to the uh, most of the county recorders these days. If, I, if I'm there for more than an hour working on stuff, you know, that's between being in line and doing some paperwork, sometimes you know, taking phone calls or whatever, I'm always going to hear at least one person talking to one of the recorders and using the term trust or trustee or beneficiary or something in that line that lets me know that yes, they are doing what they trust as well, right? So it's way more common than people think, uh, but nobody really talks about them because it's one of those kind of quiet things, right? And so then you have a beneficiary and that beneficiary, this is the private, this is the privacy part of it. The beneficiary, that's like, that's us. That's where nobody in the world needs to know who the beneficiary is. They're private, and private people, private entities, private everything. And that's what we teach in the actual class. But that's going to be us, basically. All right. And so who can be a, a, a beneficiary? For most people, it's going to be you, you yourself. So taking away, untying ourselves from the title here, untying that tether, and then going through being the beneficiary. All right. So we can do it as a beneficiary there. Right. And then we have a trustee, and the trustee is going to be the public figure. That's going to be the face of the trust. Now, trustees are not personally liable, but they are who the general public is going to deal with. And our job is to protect the identity of the beneficiary, protect their identity, and also protect their asset for them. All right. So the trustee is going to hire a property manager or project manager, which will generally be an LLC or a corporation, All right? So I don't know if you understand what I just showed you here, but we just went from the normal structure where most people take themselves, they take, they graduate from being in their own name and they jump to an LLC with some liability protection and, a, and a, an insurance policy. But what I'm showing you is we're still gonna do all of that. I'm still gonna be involved. I'm gonna have that LLC and corporation all still involved. But what we're going to do is we're going to do take title of the property through a trust. And then we personally, which, and, and that could be one of your entities as well. And we can get into that later. Um, that could be an entity, but we'll just call it for you for now. 
it's going to be beneficiary private nobody in the world is going to know who that is but there's going to be the trustee that's the public figure and then the trustee can then hire a property manager which could be your llc so it all wrapped comes back around where i'm still the one for per, the person dealing with the property but i'm doing it through a trust rather than directly as the llc owner or the owner directly so hopefully that makes sense and i'm going to bring this back up again later on uh, and and recap it i'm going to show it in another way later on as well to help this all make sense to you guys all right but who can be a beneficiary this is important to understand who can that be obviously you your llc or corporation s corp or c corporation doesn't matter basically any legal entity or any person of legal age or their guardian and when i say or their guardian there is a famous story of is it Catherine Hemingway or something like that? Can't remember the name. Some famous actress had a dog and she created a trust for the dog and then appointed a guardian for the dog. So that when she died, all her, her her whole wealth, her house, her cars, all of her assets, everything got transferred to the dog because she put everything into a trust and then appointed a guardian for the dog, but it was all via trust and had a trustee set up for the dog, right? So anybody can become the beneficiary because they had a guardian for the dog. So that was perfectly legal. And for those who are a little bit more advanced, are, they're gonna understand this. Most people are not gonna understand this next one, but that's a personal property trust. You can use a personal property trust to be the beneficiary of a trust. It's a little bit complicated, but it's a really cool thing because even, um, it, it then has, adds one more layer of protection or, or anonymity as to who the real beneficiary is, because then you could be the beneficiary of the personal property trust, and all the personal property trust gets recorded, or, you know, that's dealt with in a totally different way. Gets a little bit legally there, and it's a little bit more advanced. I know a couple people on here are already doing that strategy, uh, and most people probably don't even have a clue what I'm talking about, so don't worry about it, but that's just, I'm just giving an example of what you can do. Uh, even can be your IRA. Uh, and think about this, people. If you're, I mean, our goal, ultimate goal as, as investors is to build up our IRA, pay as little taxes as possible. One of the best tools of doing that is an IRA. All right, so we put in pre tax dollars and let the IRA do the investing and the returns on it when they're done correctly. There's some nuances too. They can't be financed and all, a bunch of other stuff. But once you get that ball rolling with an IRA, your returns can be astronomical, right? Well, do you really want to have your IRA owning property and have that on public records? Because if somebody was going to do an asset search, they're going to find your IRA, and your, if your IRA owned a bunch of properties, they can now do an asset search on the IRA and find all the properties that the IRA owns. Now, granted, there's some legal protections there, but if an attorney was astute enough and a tenant got harmed or a contractor got harmed on your property and they wanted to go to that level, there's going to be they're going to see a case there because and they'll do it on a contingency fee basis because they know that there's a asset behind there that will not want to have to deal with the legal ease and they're going to try to get you to um, negotiate and accept a bargain because they they're what they're going to do is offer you a plea bargain say hey pay this amount and we'll go away knowing that if you try to defend it it's going to cost you more than just by making the thing go away Right. So you don't want your IRA on public records. That's like really, really bad in my opinion. Okay, so components of a trust. There's the declaration and agreement of a trust. And this is going to be a pretty, it's a complex document, but it's really simple. Uh, basically, what you see on that first page is what you fill out. Then there's going to be about 10 pages of just legalese. Now I'm explaining what a trust is, what powers a trustee has, all that stuff. Uh, throughout there you know, and what they can and can't do that's all in the next probably eight or ten pages and then there's a signature page so the, the document itself is not complicated but there's some really powerful stuff in the document uh, and I'll be, I'll be talking about that in just a few minutes here so who can be the trustee uh, this is the state statutes and I and I know that they updated the statute numbers it's no longer 501 B da 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 subdivision 4 uh, they redid the, the titles and I keep, I, they did it last year and I forgot to do it last year when I did this presentation and I didn't think about it again until tonight and I just didn't have time to go and update them. But the 
definitions, I did go through them all. They're all still the same. They just retitled them, rechanged the numbers and all that. But anyways, the state statute says trustee means a person or a group of persons, either an individual, blah, 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 or a corporation or other legal entity who is vested with control or, or responsibility of administering a property. Um, basically, that, that's who can be a trustee. For us, what it really means is any person or any corporation, an LLC, an S corporation, a C corporation, a limited, uh, limited liability partnerships can be basically anything, any type of an entity is really what they're saying, can be uh, a trustee. And this is from the Minnesota state statutes. So basically anybody or everybody can be the, the trustee. So now the next question becomes, well, who can own, who owns the property? Well, the owner of the property now, when you put a property into trust, the owner becomes the trust. The trust is the owner. They own the property, right? Just like if you bought the property in LLC, who owns the, the property? It would be the LLC. In this case, it's going to be the trust. The trust owns the LLC. All right. So who controls the property? That's the more important question. Who's who's the controller? Well, that's going to be the trustee. That the owner of record will be the trustee. Right. And so the trustee does have to do some things. They manage the property, they need to find the tenants, collect rents, uh, work with the contractors, pay the utilities, uh, report to the beneficiary. All right, there, there's the, the top things there, find tenants, collect rent, utilities, or contractors. That can all be hired by property managers and project managers. But then there's reporting to the beneficiary, selling the property, signing the deed when you're selling, those types of things. Only the trustee can do those. Everything else, the trustee can hire out to, to, to manage the property. So what I do is when I have my trustees, they hire my company, one of my companies back to manage the property, right? It gets a little complicated, a little convoluted, but that's really what's happening is my trustee is hiring me to do all the work to manage the properties for ultimately for my own benefit, right? So we're just doing a, a workaround to keep it the legalized, legal way. The trustee then hires. So if you're hiring a trustee, a lot of times the trustees are going to be a family member or a friend, somebody you really trust, but you don't want them involved in your business. You just basically want them to sign the documents. Okay. That's really what you want them to do. But they do have some responsibilities. Uh, one of them is reporting to the beneficiary. So to keep a trust legal and legitimate, they're supposed to give you some annual reporting. And however you set it up, you want annual, you want quarterly, you want weekly, you want daily, whatever you want, they're supposed to follow those guidelines. So for me, I'd make it as simple as possible, just annual reporting for my beneficiary. And the way that'll work is we'll get together for a meeting over cocktails and I'll tell him what to report to me. Basically how it kind of works out. Not legally, but in practicality, that's what's gonna be happening, all right? All right, so the biggest question I usually get are, are trust legal in Minnesota? And this is where a lot of confusion comes into play when it comes to trust, because and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture and guess that more than 50% of attorneys, and I'm just guessing, I don't have any stats for this, but I'm guessing that more than 50% of the attorneys in the state of Minnesota think that trusts are illegal, but they are perfectly legal, right? In fact, they are governed under old English common law, which I referenced earlier, which means states cannot make them illegal. They can only regulate their use of them. So they can't make them illegal in any state. And what I've learned over the years is any state or country or you know province or, or so states, countries, provinces, uh, territories or whatever, basically anybody that was ever ruled by the British and did not forcibly remove the British and change their legal system. Right. If, you were, if you were under an old English common law type of a structure, trust work. I know that they work in the US. I know they work in Canada. I also know that they work in, in Mexico because I've got a friend that does properties, does investment properties down there in Mexico, and he puts them into trusts. Right? It's a lot easier, I guess, down there because they're more common, at least in the general area that he's been doing these investments in, which is a common or a popular vacation destination point for a lot of people in the US. Right? So, the, where this all comes down to, and where I'm going to say most of the attorneys, when if you were to go and ask the average attorney who does not know this, and they just go and look up the statutes and then give you a response back, 
they're going to be refer relying on these two types of trust because there's an active trust and there's a passive trust right and so we need to go through and, and understand this so you can understand where, where the person when the attorney or whoever you're talking to when they come back and say them no, they're illegal in minnesota i even had title companies say that they're illegal in minnesota right so you can understand why they're saying this and then how you can set them straight because they are wrong but it's they're not wrong they're not trying to be wrong they're just they don't understand it and they don't take it to the next level that's our job is to take it to the next level it's not their job to do our job for us it's our job to do our job for us and and get people that need to help us with this get them to understand it so that they can help us with it right and this is where you guys as investors need to learn this part there's the active express and passive express so let's go through these two All right so in the ministerial state statutes they got um purposes for which an express trust so so this is trust okay purposes for which a trust may be created an active express trust may be created for any lawful purpose I'm gonna repeat that again an active express trust may be created for any lawful purpose period end of story that's the clause that's the statute right there all right so what is an active trust all right so now we have to go and do a little bit more research and figure out what an active trust is all right and in the statutes it says a trust in which the trustee must perform certain duties again a trust an active trust is one that a trust in which the trustee must perform certain duties okay well what kind of duties would that be oh i don't know how about find tenants collect rents pay utilities work with the contractors report to the beneficiary and sell the property those are certain duties right so that's what an active trust may be created for now where they get confused is they read this next the next definition which is passive trusts abolished passive trust abolished it says passive express trust of real or personal property are abolished and they stop right there they don't read all i got them dotted out right now for you guys right now but they read that and they say they're abolished and in their mind that means illegal all right abolished does not mean illegal you need to be you don't need to be a, a rocket scientist to understand this but apparently you need more than a law degree to understand this because most lawyers don't understand this because they just read abolish and then all of a sudden they default to illegal. A good honest attorney is not gonna make that play, but they're just gonna say, you know what, you can't do them according to the state of Minnesota, they're illegal, and they wanna move on because they don't wanna go and learn this stuff is really what it comes down to. Um, in fact, one of my uh, attorney friends, one we're really good friends right now is, uh, and this was 25 years ago, at least 25 years ago, uh, he had called me one day out of the blue and said, hey, Mike, um, I'm an attorney, blah, blah, blah. And I've got a client that is looking to put a property into a trust. And I don't know anything about trust. So I started doing some research. And apparently you are the authority of trust here in the state of Minnesota. So do you have a few minutes I can pick your brain about trust? I'm like, sure. Well, he's gone on to make hundreds of thousands of dollars off of that education that i provide him and he can't pay me a dime because i'm not licensed all right and so i made the guy really wealthy because he took the time to learn trusts all right most attorneys don't want to do that right most attorneys what they want to do is they read that and they leave but let's go in and dig a little deeper and see what a passive trust is so the definition of a passive trust is a trust in which the trustee performs no active duties right a trust in which the trustee performs no active duties okay in essence and this is coming from black's law dictionary a trust is a simple trust which vests into the trustee the title to the property and the power to convey or deal with the property at the direction of the trust beneficiary this is where most people okay so most attorneys are either going to stop at the abolished or they're going to go a little bit further and say um at the direction of the trust beneficiary right that if you're acting solely at the direction of the trust beneficiary then according to black's law dictionary it's a passive trust not an active trust right so that's where they're saying oh because of that 
they're illegal in the state of Minnesota. And most of us as investors, we're, try, we're, we're putting the property into trust. As a beneficiary, we're directing the director, uh, directing the trustee on how to handle the, the assets. So they're saying that, so therefore it's abolished. That means that they're illegal, all right? Well, first of all, we talked about that there are certain duties that the trustee has to perform, right? And if you do things my way, you're not directing somebody to do them, you are doing them yourself as a trustee, all right? But that's still all kind of, it gets, it gets in the gray area, but it falls back into under this category. A good attorney can say, you know what? Even if you are doing it that way, you're still doing it at the direction of the, of the beneficiary because you are the beneficiary and the trustee. So you're telling yourself what to do, right? And it can get complicated and, and convoluted about that. But let's go back to here and let's finish reading this clause that I dotted out for you because it says, an attempt to create a passive trust vests the entire state granted in the beneficiary. All right, so this gets a little bit complicated. So, so stick with me here. And let's try to walk this through and break it down. It says, passive express trusts of real or personal property are abolished and an attempt to create, an attempt to create, meaning I would have to attempt to create a trust that would be an express passive trust or passive express trust, meaning it's not active. The, the trustee would have no duties whatsoever. I'd have to attempt to create one where they have no duties, right? So if I attempt to create one, a passive trust, that would best the entire estate granted in the beneficiary. Okay, well, who's the beneficiary? We talked about that, that's us, our LLC, which is the way we would have done things before we had properties in the trust. But what's the purpose of the trust? Not for the li liability protection, it's for the privacy. So I still wanna put the property, even if they came back and said, uh, you've created a passive trust, even if they said that, first of all, they would only be able to determine that if I was being sued. And if I was being sued, I'd be sued on that specific property, not on all my properties. And if they came back and said, because it's a passive trust, it's abolished, so therefore we're gonna vest the estate into you, which is what it would have been in the first place. So now I just created all that extra work for them to do what I would have been if I didn't have the trust in the first place. So it means nothing in the, in the long run. What it, this means is, is I can't use it as a liability protection tool. Right. Well, I'm never, and this is when I when I do a lot of this training, I tell people, hey, my everyone, way I'm gonna teach you, I know you can use trust as an asset protection tool. And in your mind, you're thinking of it as an asset protection tool, where what you really need to be thinking about is a privacy tool. You still have your LLCs and your corporations and your liability insurance and a good defense attorney. You have all that, but I want it private in the first place so we don't ever have to get to this point where they have to work really hard and spend a lot of time and a lot of money just to, just to get a judge to say, you know what, this is a passive trust. So therefore we're gonna vest the estate into you, right? Nobody on the planet is gonna go through and do that if a tenant fell and broke their leg. But if, they, if a tenant broke, falls and breaks their leg on your property and everything's in your own name, you're now gonna be shut down. You're not gonna be able to sell any of your properties. You're not gonna be able to buy anything. Your business is shut down until you get that, that, that issue dealt with. But as long as everything's private, you don't have to worry about that. So let's go back to, to this passive versus active of trust. So do we have active or passive? I, and I kind of jumped ahead of myself. An active trust hires a trustee, the property manager signs the documents, all that stuff. So yes, we, in my mind, and I'm going to argue that I do have an active trust. But worst case scenario, they come back and say, no, nope, you've got a passive trust. All right, well, okay, great. You've you've caught me, you said my trust doesn't give me any liability protection, what's our next step? What it basically does is, you know, it says, if we look back at our, our um, graph here, saying, okay, rather than, and I gotta try to figure out a way to do this, but all this trust stuff over here, we're gonna eliminate all of that, and we're just gonna go after you personally or after your LLC, whatever, okay? That's really what it's saying. And what this is, what we're doing here with the land trust is we're making, our name or our company name, we're making that private. Nobody can find that. That's only the, the trustee knows who that is. The rest of the public doesn't know that that's us. So even if somebody said, oh, Mike owns that property. Well, when they go and look at it, no, Mike does not own that property. They're gonna have to spend a lot of time and money and effort to try to prove that I'm the beneficiary of a trust, which is gonna be really difficult for them to do. 
because I'm going to make it almost impossible. And there's games and advanced strategies that we can do that they'll, they'll be chasing things for, I mean, they could be chasing things for the next 20 years just to get to the point where they can ever come back and say, hey, no, this is a passive trust and Mike is the beneficiary. So therefore we can come after you. Okay, you just wasted 20 years. In the meantime, it didn't affect me at all. I was still able to do everything I needed to do because you could never get an injunction against me or a judgment against me or any of my properties, just that one particular property, right? So you take one property out of the game, but whereas if I had 40 properties and I had them all in my na own name and somebody wanted to come after me, you took all my properties out of my name. Being in a trust, you, if if something happened, and God forbid it did, but now they're only dealing with one property, they, they can't go after all the rest of them because they're not in the same entity. They're all separate, different entities. Okay, and so what kind of ownership um, do we have? Let, let's, this is where we need some understanding. What kind of ownership? So we showed you this. Who owns the property? The trust. The beneficiary, let's say we personally, let's just say it's us personally. And a good example is gonna be our personal residence, right? I'm the beneficiary of my personal residence. It's not an LLC, it's not in a corporation, it's me personally for my personal residence. All right. So who own what kind of ownership do I own as the beneficiary? Do I have personal property ownership or real property? Do I own personal property or do I own real property? All right. I'm betting right now that if I open it up for, for a poll or a question, I probably should have put this in a poll. And gotten people's responses, but I bet you right now it's probably about 50 50. Some pe half the people are going to say personal property, and half the people are going to say real property. And I put chattel in here because chattel it's just a fun term to play around with, but I, that is the old English legal term for real for personal property. It's called chattel. Uh, if you look in Black's Law Dictionary, it's going to be called chattel. The definition of chattel is personal property. So you have real property, which is real estate, the land, anything attached to the land. If it's not attached to the land, it's real property, or I mean chattel. So it's personal property, right? So if we go back here, who owns the property? The trust does. So what do we own? We own personal property because our ownership is not land. It's interest in an entity that owns some land. Hopefully that makes that clear. And I know this is where I, I, I start to lose some people. We don't own the property. The trust owns it. We own the trust. The trust is not property. It's by default, if it's not real property, the only thing it can be is personal property. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's look at a, at a breakdown of properties in multiple property situations, right? And, and start visioning how this all plays together. So let's say we got find a house and we're going to put into a, a trust, right? So we have trust, call it trust one, and we're going to have a trustee. So trustee, we'll call it trustee A. And then we are the beneficiary, which is private. Nobody knows this, right? Now we go and buy a second property. So what do we do with the second property? Well, house two, we're going to create a second land trust, right? So there's one trust for house one. There's a second trust for house two. We can use the same trustee for both properties though. They can be the same, all right? And then let's say now we're gonna go buy our third property, our third investment property. So we have house three, we create a third land trust. So each property has its own trust, right? And trust for us, once you learn how to create them yourself, there's no additional cost to creating the trust, zero additional cost for creating a trust once you learn how to do them yourself. If you're gonna hire somebody, yeah, then there's a cost. But if you, once you learn how to do them yourself, there's no additional cost. All right, and then we can either have trustee A being the same one, or we can start creating different trustees. So I can have multiple trustees, or I can have one single trustee for all of them. All right, but the common denominator is we're the beneficiary, right? And so in the practical world, when we put all this together, the beneficiary information is hidden. All of this is visible to the public. So the public can see the houses, and they can see the name of the trust, and they can see who the trustees are. But the trustees are not personally liable, we keep saying, it, as long as they haven't committed fraud, right? And the beneficiary, us down here, that's private, and it's hidden from the public. So nobody else can see who the owner of the beneficiary is, right? That's private information that's only known between us and our, and our trustee, 
right? So naming a trust, what do you name a trust? Basically anything you want. There's no limit. You don't have to register it with the state. You don't even need to get an EIN number. In fact, the IRS doesn't even require you to get an employer identification number for a trust so long as you fall within one of one of these exemptions. And for real estate, it we fall into like four of, of the five exemptions, right? So we're, we're, we're covered there. We don't have to worry about that. The IRS does not want us to get an EIN number. We still have to file our taxes, and this is the beauty of trust. We're going to file the taxes as if we didn't have a trust. So the IRS only cares where are the income and expenses coming out of what entity. So they treat it as a flow through entity. So we have an LLC. The LLC is going to be writing the, the check to the mortgage company. And when our tenant pays the, the, the rent, it's going to our well, maybe a property manager or it's going directly to our LLC. So the income and expenses are coming through the LLC. That's what the IRS cares about. Like my, my accountant doesn't even know the properties are in trust, except for the fact that he does. I mean, but he doesn't report them as in trust. He just puts down the property address and then puts that on my, on my uh, whatever, 1120 or whatever for my LLC for those. And if it's a rehab property, well, then it's just inventory and it's in and out and it's through my rehab company. But it's a flow through entity as far as the IRS is concerned. So you can name anything you want. You can call it the Evergreen Foundation Land Trust. You can call it the Running Wild Land Trust. You call it the yellow fever no more. And I just added this one today for everybody. No more coronavirus land trusts. <laughs> okay. So you can get creative with them, call them whatever you want to call them. Uh, call it the roadrunner land trust. Or now, now there's some problems with these though, because I said, if you remember, we're not recording them with the secretary of state. So there's no entity out there to prevent somebody else from having the exact same name trust. So if, they, if somebody else had the exact same name trust, then now there's a conflict on who's the ownership. And that's where some real problems can come into play, which is why I created my own strategy years, years ago. And I name it the county. So in this case, let's say the property address is 123 Main Street. I call it Ramsey County 55106, if that's the zip code, 123 Main Street Land Trust. Now you'll notice the name of the trust here carry down into the second line, right? Same thing happens on computer screens. So when you the county recorder is recording them, I have never had one put it on, on the public, you know, on the, the public website where people can go and look on the public records and see who's the owner. It's usually gonna say Ramsey County, uh, and then it'll be like maybe 123 Main Street LT, or it'll be Lakes Trust, which is one of my, comp my trustee companies, Lakes Trust uh, Corporation. Right, and Lakes Trust is not an owner. Lakes Trust is just a trustee. So they'll put all kinds of different things on there. I have never had one yet where the name of the trust was actually on public records exactly as it's spelled out. So if they create these weird abbreviations and somebody goes and finds it on public records and then goes and does an asset search, they're not even gonna find that property. They're not gonna find anything. But that's why now, and this is a very unique one because the only way somebody else is gonna have the exact same name for that trust is they own the exact same property or if they put the property using my naming strategy and they'd owned it before and it never got deeded out of it or whatever. So it's almost impossible for anyone to have that particular trust name. So that's why I use it. And then the other reason is I, I do this is when the mail comes from the county and I get my, um, should I just got some right here? Uh, well, this one here says Lakes Trust Corp. So the one here. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, that, that one says, the one here I just got says Lakes Trust Corporation, they just came today. And the other one here says the Ramsey County 551119 and blah, 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 trust. But it's not the full address, it's not the full name of that particular property, All right? So that just little things like that are gonna throw anybody off that's trying to do any asset search if somebody was gonna try and do an asset search on you, All right? So. And in the beginning days, I did start creating these, these weird funky names because that's how we were taught 20 some years ago, 25 years ago, that's how we were trained to do them. And then over time, I just, you know what, I need a better system. Because at one point I had so many properties with all these weird, weird names, I'd get the stuff in the mail and I'd have to go to a file. I literally had to create an Excel spreadsheet to match up the, the names that I created with these trusts to the properties. So now I had to have another document just try to figure out what property that was for because when you're dealing with legal documents, they don't have property addresses. They have property uh, legal descriptions on them. And then they'll have the owner's name. 
right? So that's why I came up with this strategy years ago and it works. Another cool thing about it is if you were just to say, okay, well, let me just do a quick search and find out what Ramsey, oh, wait a minute, Ramsey, see Ramsey County. Now, if you did a search for Ramsey County or Hennepin County, you're going to find a lot of property because one, you're going to find the property that they actually own and you're going to find all the tax forfeited property that they've gotten back through tax forfeiture. So you can't just do a search for Ramsey County like you would be able to do a search for Mike Jacka or Metro Home Buyers. That's why I don't want my name or my company's name on public records. All right? What not to name a trust? Don't name it the Smith Family Land Trust. All right? And this strategy comes into play for like, especially for subject to deals. So if you're buying a property subject to, one of the strategies is they say, well, because of the due on sale clause, and a lot of people are afraid of the due on sale clause and saying, you know, if you put the property into trust, you know, if, if, it, you know, if I, got, I should do a subject to class again here pretty soon. But when you're taking a property into trust, there's a due on sale, I mean, into, if you're doing it subject to, there's a due on sale clause. <clears throat> when it comes to the due on sale clause, that means that if you transfer ownership to somebody else without paying off the loan, the lender has the right to call the loan due. Well, that's technically true. I mean, they don't, but that's technically true. They do have the right to do it. They don't do it, but they have the right. But in the beginning days when I was learning this, the banks were calling them due because this is after the, the 1986 um, SNL debacle and the market crashed after that time. So late 80s, early 90s, and I got started in real estate in the early 90s, and I learned trust in the mid 90s. They were still calling loans due back then because of transfer. They don't anymore, but there's another reason for that. <clears throat> Interest rates is basically the reason. They don't want to pay off, take a loan that's in, in that's not in default and make it in default because the, the investors lose money. Back in the day, though, when the interest rates were 20%, or no, when the rates were at 10% and they were writing new loans out at 20%, they wanted to force you to pay off that, that low interest rate loan to be able to write the loan again at the higher interest rate. But now that the rates are gone the other way, it makes no sense for the banks to call them due. But we did learn this back in the day and I found a problem with this, and that was getting my proceeds check after I, when I sell a property later, like a year later, two years, five years later, the title companies, they're used to trusts, just not land trusts. They're used to living trusts. And a living trust is where you put all your assets into the living trust and they pass to your heirs. So, and they're usually called the Smith Family Trust or whatever. And so the title companies, if they're brand new title companies I'd never worked with before and I'd have to train them, constantly I was having to try to explain to them no you can't make it out to the, the Smith family land trust because it's not the Smith family property it's mine well we need to make it out to the name of the trust or we have to make it out to the name of the entity or the trustee so it took a long time for me to get convinced them that you can just write the write out to the trustee but they're not used to that so there's some legal ease there now I can legally explain to them that that's the case and give them legal documentation and all that but I found it was a hard sell for these title companies that once I created the, the Ramsey County 55106 123 Main Street Trust, then it was really easy because then they started saying, well, I'm assuming you don't have a trust for this or a, a checking account for it, so you're not going to be able to deposit the check. Who do you want me to write it out to? So it just made it so much easier for them to ask and work with me when I started changing the name rather than the Smiley Smal 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 Trust. Now, I know a couple of investors that are still using this with no problem, but they're only using one particular title company who understands it. I don't want to have to go... Every few years, I'm, I'm working with new title companies all the time for some reason. Uh, go through a lot of title companies over the years. And I don't want to have to be trying to reteach these all the time. Plus, you guys are going to be working with them. I just want to be as easy as possible for you guys. All right. So what name goes on the purchase agreement when you're buying a property? What name do you put on that PA? All right. When the trustee is present, just put the name of the trust. And then the trustee can sign as trustee. So in this case, I had put, you know, Ramsey County 551061223 Main Street. That's the buyer's name on, on the PA. The buyer's name is Ramsey County, blah, blah, blah. And then on the signature line, I sign, <clears throat> just to make things simple, I have signed Mike Jack as trustee of the Ramsey County 551061223 Main Street Land Trust. So I would be signing as the trustee for the trust. Uh, in our workshop, we, we get a little bit more advanced, so we turn, teach you how to use entities and all that to actually be the trustee. Okay, and then how to sign that. And then your signature gets really long when you guys start saying Mike Jack as president of blah, 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 as trustee of the blah, blah, blah. Right? It gets really long. So this is the simple way of doing it. If your trustee, like say you're going to hire a trustee, maybe a brother or you know a sister or a cousin or whatever, 
and they're not even in the state of Minnesota. FYI, the further they live from you, the better it is for, for, for your privacy because they're really not gonna be able to find that person in the state because the only thing, the trustee's information is gonna be public information, right? So their name will be on the public records. Now, if they don't live in the state of Minnesota, it makes it even harder for them to find them. So think outside the box, people, and have somebody outside the state. But if that's the case, they're not present, you, they can't sign as a trustee. So what you can do is go put your name. So in this case, John Home Buyers, and then this is the magic terminology here with title vested in the, and then the name of the trust. So now your name on the purchase agreement gets a little bit longer. So you have to put your, your name or your company's name with title vested in the, and then you can sign, but you're, this is the legal definition telling the title company that you're gonna be taking title in the name of a trust, right? So you don't have to have the trustee present to sign this here, and this works. Now, not everyone understands what this legal ver term means, so sometimes you have to educate them as well that that's the legal term for telling where I can sign, but I'm gonna take title into an entity, but I'm signing personally or I'm signing to another company, right? I prefer the way I do it as I have, I'm, I have an entity set up as, and this is our advanced stuff that we talk about in the class. I have a, a company set up as my own trustee. So when we get back to that, all that active versus passive stuff I was talking about, I'm gonna argue that I'm at, still it's an active trust, but if I ran into a really smart, astute attorney who understands the stuff, they're gonna blow right through that and they're gonna get through to my entity underlining that. And I still have an entity which still has all that liability protection underneath, but I add that extra layer of protection. We talk about that kind of stuff in that workshop on how to add those extra layers of protection on it. Right? So some of the do's and don'ts, um, do be creative and do use long names. The longer the name, the harder it is for them to, the more likely it is that they're going to have to turncate the name or come up with some creative abbreviations when they're putting it onto the public records so that when anybody's looking up on public records, they're not going to be able to find the exact name. Just like when you look at um, legal descriptions on public records, you can't do a, a legal search for a property based on the legal description. Like if you took a legal description and you're going to do a quick claim deed on a property, you took what was available on the public records, on the public side of it, on the website, that will never pass muster. That'll always get kicked out and rejected because that legal description will not match the actual real legal description on record. Don't use short names, don't use your name, and don't use a seller name. Those are the bottom lines when it comes to those. All right, so what forms do we wanna use? The most important ones is gonna be the trust document and the warranty deed to trustee. Uh, and then there's some additional ones down in there. Uh, the management agreement as well is another one that I use a lot. Uh, so like I'll take title of the property and I'll have the warranty deed to trustee. And we're going to go through some of these terms and, and verbiages within the trust and the, in the warranty deed in just a moment. But so a lot of times I'll, I'll do that. And then the trustee is going to hire my, my other company, which will be the management agreement. So you want to have a management agreement for the trust, uh, especially when it comes to um, rental properties in Minneapolis and St. Paul or any other city where you have to get a, a rental license uh, if they they're going to match it up and say well the owner of the of the you know the owner is a trust and it's another company that's the trustee so who are you like especially if you're using a a relative and they live in a different state or a really good friend they live in a different state how are you going to explain that so that's where i came up with the management agreement and then i have them hire my company to do the management right so and yeah, and, that, and that's some of the stuff where I teach you guys at the at workshop, where I actually have one company that's set up for, as my buying agent and as my property management agent. It doesn't own any property. It doesn't hold on to any property. It buys, renovates, and sells and manages, but it doesn't hold on to it. So I have one company, that's that Metro Home Buyers, one I'm always talking about. That's the public figure. It doesn't own any property, but it's the one that I always talk about. I never talk about the other corporations behind the scenes or the LLCs that are behind the scenes. I never talk about even to you guys because I don't want you guys to even know what they are. But I'm okay with telling you Metro Home Buyers because it doesn't own anything. You can do all the searching you want. It doesn't own anything. But at, at all the, uh, the rental licenses are all in Metro Home Buyers uh, because of the property manager. The utilities are all in Metro Home Buyers. That way I have one company that I remember all that. A little bit more advanced. We talk about that kind of stuff at the, at the training. 
right? So what gets recorded? It's going to be the warranty deed to trustee. Now, the warranty deed, it's a specific deed that was created, and I don't remember who I got it from years and years ago, either Lou Brown or Ron Grand or uh, Deitch Rutherford or uh, Bill Bronchuk, I can't remember. I learned from all those guys. I don't remember where I got the specific one from, but that's not a, the important part. The important part is what's in the terminology, and I'll cover that in just a moment. Most importantly, though, the, what does not get recorded is the trust document itself, and this is the biggest problem, the biggest misconception with most people is everyone says, well, I need a copy of the trust. Well, no, you do not. Uh, you need a copy of the trust. No, actually, you do not need a copy of the trust. Um, well, I can't sell the property without a copy of the trust. BS. Uh, follow the laws. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in just a moment. How do you convey title? Because a trust document is a private document. That's where it spells out who the beneficiary is, who the trustee, all those powers. Now, we need to get those powers on public records. And that's, there's a clause in there. I'm going to go through in a moment. It takes the powers out of the trust and puts them under the warranty deed to trustee. So if you're not using the warranty deed to trustee and you're just going to use a regular deed, like, and this is very common, like if I'm buying a bank REO, I'm going to have to use that special deed that they provide. And then I just take those powers that are in the trust, the warranty deed to the trust, I put them into an addendum and I send them over to the title company and say, okay, attach this addendum. I'll sign, I'll, I'll accept their deed so long as they attach this addendum to that deed, which then spells out the powers to the trustee, because that's important that we get that on public record, the powers to the trustee without having to record the trust document. All right, so how do you sell a property that's in, in trust? It's easy, it's actually easy to get the property into trust. It, it's harder or there's more steps to get a property out of trust. And this is where the real confusion and concern comes into play because people don't understand it. But there's a, now there's gonna be a trustee's deed, not the warranty deed to trustee. This is the trustee's deed. The title company has these, they will fill all this stuff out for you. There's a trustee's deed, then there's a certificate of trust and an affidavit of trustee, right? So when we're buying, there's the trust document and the warranty deed, we have to fill that stuff out. Uh, no, there's no title company on the planet that'll fill out the warranty deed to trustee because it's not a Miller Davis form. They don't have it on their system, right? But I fill those out and I provide it to them. I've had them when they fill them out for me, but they, they're not they're not supposed to do the filling out and you still have to put it on there that I registered because it's not a standard document, but it's a legal document. And the trust document, because that's private for us. But when we're selling, the title company will provide and they will fill out the trustee deed, certificate of trust and affidavit of trustee, All right? So um, let's see, the trust document, because that's private, if we go down here to the section, powers of the trust, this is the section that I strip out and then I want to get put into the incorporate into the trustee's deed. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, full power and authority granted to trustee with respect to the said premises or any part of it at any time, blah, blah, blah. So all this is going to be in it. And this is what we want. If we don't have the warranty deed to trustee, we want to get all this verbiage into an addendum and get that attached and recorded on public records. And the most important part is at the bottom and it says, and to deal with said property, this is the trustee. The trustee has the power to deal with the said property and every part thereof in all other ways and for such other considerations as would be lawful for any person owning the same to deal with the same, whether similar to or different from the ways that specified above at any time or times here, hereafter. Uh, it, it basically, that bottom section there is a coverall for everything for the trustee. That's why we need this on public records. So if anyone's saying, oh, I need a copy of the trust. No, you don't. You just need to know who the trustee is and that's already on public records and the, the powers within the trust are already spelled out here. The other thing is we need a certificate of trust and the affidavit of trustee. Affidavit of trustee is just saying, hey, I find that I am still the trustee. I swear to God that I'm still the trustee. But the certificate of trust is the one where we record on public records. And this is from the state statutes again. And I'll read the most important part. It says, when it is recorded, the certificate of trust we're talking about, when it is recorded or filed in the county where the real property is situated, or in the case of personal property, when it is presented to a third party, the certificate of trust serves to document the existence of the trust, the identity of the trustees, the powers of the trustees, and any limitations on those powers. And other matters, the certificate of, sets, uh, certificate of trust sets out as though the full trust instrument had been recorded, filed, or presented. 
In other words, a certificate of trust is prima facie proof that the trust exists and that you are the trustee and you have the, the right, the power and authority. So that combined with that other terminology on, on public records is all you will ever need. There are a few circumstances where I have had to provide the, the trust document, but those are rarities. Uh, one of them comes into play is if you're gonna, if you got a property in a trust and you're gonna refinance it with a lender that'll allow you to keep the property in the trust, uh, they will want a copy of the trust document. Okay, give it to them, but that's a private transaction that's and that's not going to be recorded on public records a trust document they just want to verify that you are that it is a valid trust and that they have something to come after if you didn't make the payments on it so there's circumstances like that um i have had it where uh, we there was some missing information on the original deed so we had to record the, the trust so i think i probably only had to do it two or three times out of maybe about 70 or 80 properties that i've had in trust of my own personal ones uh, and it usually just comes a matter of, hey, what do you need? What, what I really say is, when it comes down to it, I say, okay, what do we need to do to get this done? And then they then we, they tell me, and if I have no other solutions, and it comes down to recording that deed as a trust, I'll do it. But usually at that point, I'm selling the property, so I don't care afterwards anyway. All right? The affidavit of trustee basically is just you're you're swearing that you are the trustee and nothing has changed. Um, Okay, so a little bit more advanced, and then we're going to uh, call our quits, is wholesaling. I'm going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow night on our wholesaling 101 class. Um, is This is one of the advanced strategies, uh, and I've just talked to like three people now in the last two or three weeks on how to use these because more and more uh, wholesalers are saying, you know what, I need to start doing some of this stuff. All right, so you get a property under contract with the seller and then put the property under contract with the buyer, but be a trust. So the seller, with the seller, you're going to take title you, you know, you as the trustee in the name of the uh, the trust, right? And then when I sell it to my end buyer, I'm going to make them the beneficiary, and then I stay on as the trustee while they renovate the property. So they will never show up on public records. Now, if they end up holding on to the property for the long term, then I don't want to be the trustee for the long term. So then what I'll do is after the trust. Then I'll say, I mean, after the closing, I'll say, okay, let's get it closed. And then now who do you want to be your trustee? Do you want to be yourself? Do you want to have an entity? Do you have a relative or a friend? Who do you want to be the trustee? And then I will quit claim my my interest as a trustee to somebody else as a trustee. And that's done via a quit claim deed. Or you can even do a warranty deed. It doesn't matter. Either one will work just fine. But then when you're getting paid, you're not doing an, assign or an assignment fee. You're getting paid as a trustee servicing fee from the title company and that they can put right on the hud statement on the closing documents so i think it makes things really nice and simple when you're wholesaling and if there's an if you're worried about assignments there's no assignment if you're worried about deed restrictions there's no need for a deed restriction and if you're worried about you know being the person dealing with the seller and at the closing you would be because you came in as a trustee and you go out as a trustee whereas if you're uh, wholesaling you're coming in as the buyer, but you're not coming out as the buyer, right? So it's totally different. It's just a cleaner, simpler way, but you need to understand trust and your end buyer needs to understand them as well. And that's been my goal is to get as many people as possible knowing, using, and understanding trust so that we can start wholesaling to each other via trust. It just makes things so much cleaner, simpler, and easier. Plus, it keeps that anonymity for who the owners are underneath, right? So if you think about it, it's a beautiful thing. All right, and then lastly is personal property trusts, right? Cars, boats, bank accounts, lease options. One of our members just a few months ago called asking about doing a, putting a, a bank account in a trust, right? So they've got their bank account, their personal bank account, and it's in a trust. And that trust has an EIN number with the IRS so they could open up. But now they have a bank account that is not in their personal name at the bank. So now you can have your bank assets in there without having to worry about, you know, if you did get a judgment or lien against you and they wanted to come after the bank to collect on it, they can't because it's not in your name, it's in a trust name. Uh, so anything and everything you want to do that. Like I have my my vehicle, so my truck is in a trust, my motorcycle is in a trust, my four-wheeler and snowmobile, those are in trust. And so everything I have in a trust, and the cool part about like the truck and the trust is, and I use the same naming strategy. So it's like Ramsey County, 
blah, blah, blah. And then I use part of the VIN number to make it really unique. Um, but I know when cops are following behind me, they'll, they'll be running my plate and it's going to come up as Ramsey County. And usually after they do that, then they bounce away. And they you know, and I think they they got these scanners now that'll scan the, the license plates and it'll come up so they can see that it's Ramsey County. Well, if I'm in Ramsey County or Hennepin County or, you know, you know the surrounding counties here, they're like, oh, it's Ramsey County. It's Ramsey County employee, live alone. Uh, but if I'm, I have had that backfire with me. I was in another county, uh, south of the city is a little ways. And apparently that highway patrolman did not have a good relationship with Ramsey County. Uh, so he gave me a ticket on that one anyways. Didn't let me out of it. But the interesting thing is, and this is where one of the real lessons came into play, is when I first started putting the properties in the trust, and, and I do have a lead foot, so I, I tend to get a ticket or two. I mean, I've had my fair share over the years. Um, not as much these days. Uh, I think the cops have just gotten so sick and tired of giving me tickets, they leave me alone now, because uh, I have not slowed down. Um, but in the beginning days, when cops would pull me over and they say, well, show me the, your registration, and they're like, well, who's via, you work for the county? No. Nope. Well, it's in the name of the county. Uh, yeah, no, it's in the name of a trust. It just happens to be Ramsey County, blah, 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 personal property trust. And as soon as I say personal property trust, they stop asking questions. I've even had one cop because I had uh, my vehicle had broken into, uh, this is probably 15 years ago, had gotten broken into and they took a GPS out of my truck. And the cop says, uh, gets all done. He asked me about that. And then he got done and he stopped asking questions about it, did up the whole report, got it all filed, says, I'm out of here. He says, but by the way, I just, just out of curiosity, um, and I'm not asking for legal reasons, I'm just asking for myself, um, what is a trust, a personal property trust? And I explained to him, I, I said, well, it's, a, it's an entity for holding property. It can be real estate, it can be vehicles, it can be anything, and it's any trust, and then there's a trustee, but the beneficiary remains private. He's like, oh, that is so cool. I got to learn how to do that myself. And then he left. That's all it was. So I've never had one. And that's where I started realizing, I think it's actually illegal for them to ask. And the cops know that it's illegal for them to ask who the beneficiary is. Because it is. They, they cannot force us to tell who the beneficiary is. So they've never had me. They've never asked me who the beneficiary was. And as soon as they hear personal property trust, they don't ask any more questions. So some of them give me the tickets and some of them give me warnings and let me off with warnings. So. That's that. All right, we went a little longer than I was expecting. Now I wanna see what we have for questions. Hopefully I answered most of your questions, but I'm sure I did not. Uh, so I figured we got seven minutes, minutes till nine. So let's just see what I can get through on questions. Um, oh, wow, there's a ton of them in here. I went far enough back when I'm starting to see people responding to me about uh, stay at home order. Oh, so he's going to do a talk tomorrow. Okay, good. Uh, if someone was asking about membership earlier, yeah, um, just get a hold of us tomorrow. Just call the office. Uh, if you call the office tomorrow, even though we're all, everyone but me, is all working from home, they've all got the phones at home, so you just call the office number, it'll still ring to their house. Right now, it's just going to ring to voicemail. But if you call during the day, um, it, uh, Daryl, Jennifer, Anna, uh, one of them should answer the phone as well. Um, okay, so for those of you who are still on here, I want to... Uh, remind you guys that happy hour tomorrow uh, if you guys get if you guys want to get on there tomorrow i believe kim burke i talked to her the other day and somebody was just commented and mentioned her name here so this was from earlier tonight uh, but uh, kim is going to come on and we're going to talk about what she's seeing in the mortgage industry right now because i was talking to her the, uh, the other day and she's like in my little world everything is just peachy she said last week she wrote she underwrote eight loans uh, and I was talking to another investor today who just got a property under, just run, excuse me, just finished renovating the property, got it under, got it under contract, 
yesterday with multiple offers, right? So there's still a lot going on right now. And I think a lot of people are getting a little bit discouraged about what's been happening because they're spending way too much time on Facebook and social media. People, I've completely gotten off of that. I mean, I'll pop on there every now and then just to see if there's anything funny. And if you guys are catching me and hitting my funny bone, I'm sticking on there. And if I see anything that's political and, and you get my blood boiling and, and, I, and that's not what I wanted to talk about, but I'll give you guys a tip of what I've been doing to just get through all this is I'll see somebody say something that really bugs me and takes me the wrong way or, or they misinterpret something that somebody else had said because I know where that somebody else is coming from. And then you got all these, you know, um, Nazis out there, uh, coronavirus Nazis, I'm calling them, that are going out there just calling everyone pigs and disgusting, you know, pieces of whatever. I'll get on there and I'll start writing this comment that I'm like, I would love to say this and this is how I would respond. And if it wasn't for what's going on right now, under normal circumstances, I say it, but I type it all out, get it off my chest, and then I hit delete and I don't even post it. Right. So it's been very, very th therapeutic to me. But I find if I do that one time, then I shut off Facebook and I don't look at it for another 24 hours. So I know people have been trying to contact me even through Facebook. Forget it. I'm I'm, a, I'm so disgusted with what's going on out there right now. Everything's fine in my world. And I'm going to keep on moving on that way. So hopefully you guys can take some of that. But that's why I wanted to start the happy hour so we can talk and get on the positive side. Hear the positive things that are coming from people, not from a presentation standpoint, not from a learning or an educational thing, but how you and I would talk if we would just sat down over lunch or over a coffee, over a beer, how we would just talk about life in general and what's been going on. And literally, that's, you know, only there's been a couple people on here so far, but that's literally what it's been. So I'd love to have 40, 50 people on here every day, you know, and just get in here and just listen to people, you know, um, talk, just keep it civil. Uh, and you can get some chats going on with other people. We just get on for an hour every day in the middle of the afternoon. I think that's about the right time when people are, their, their nerves are at the worst. And I could tell because that's when they're all calling the office, wanting to talk to me and wanting me to talk them off the edge and say that everything's going to be okay because it will be. We just have to get through this next couple of weeks, I think. Uh, okay, so somebody here earlier was saying that their lawyer had said that they have to let the lender know if they take a property subject to. Uh, no. That, that's why I said there's a lot of misunderstanding about all that stuff. You don't legally have to let the lender know when it comes to the due on sale clause. There's a clause in the due on sale clause or acceleration clause in the mortgage that says that if you transfer ownership without their permission, they have the right to call the loan due. Now, if you do let them know and you get their permission, then they can't call the loan due. So that's what they're saying. But there's no legal requirement for you to let the lender know. But you're gonna have to let them know anyways. Um, and, and, and don't be afraid of it. So I don't go out there and ask permission, but I actually know a couple of investors that are calling them up and saying, this is what we're gonna do. You got a problem with it? And they're like, I don't know if we have a problem with it or not. I'm legally I'm supposed to tell you, yes, we do, but I don't know. I've had, I got a couple of investors that are doing that every time. Um, there, there are so many different ways. And I just had a conversation. I went up the totem pole, uh, this was last month. No, I should probably th two weeks ago, three weeks ago. On one of my subject twos, and I, I got all my subject to properties set up on auto auto draw. So it comes out of my checking account all the time. And I'm saying a couple of weeks ago, heck, this was last week, duh. This, this last two weeks have been absolutely insane for us because I also run all the websites for all the RIAs around the country and everyone's had to transition and remodel over from live trainings to all these online versions. Uh, so I've been working with a lot of other RIAs and I just, the last two weeks are like a blare to me. Anyways, yeah, this was literally just a week, week and a half ago. I hadn't paid any attention the last two months. The payments had not been withdrawn from the account. I know, last three months. So I got a letter, certified letter last week from the post office. They dropped it in here. I had a sign for it. And I opened it up and I'm like, it says I owe payments. I'm like, no, I don't. What are you talking about? So I went and checked online and I'm like, oh my God, it says they haven't made a payment in three months. So I tried to make the payment and they wouldn't even let me make the payment because that option had been disabled and it said that I owed. And so on the letter, it gave me the amount that I owed. So I called up and I said, hey, and I'm trying to figure out how to make this payment, blah, blah, blah. 
and they're like, well, I can't talk to you because you're not on loan, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, can you tell me who's making the payments? And they're like, well, I can see you're making the payments, but I don't have authority to talk to you. I'm like, well, let me talk to your manager. Okay, well, I'm, and same same situation. I had to do it like three or four times. Let me talk to your manager. Well, finally, I get one, the manager came, probably must have came back to him and said, just go deal with the guy and help him out because the manager didn't want to talk to me and talk to him anymore. I was like, all right, well, here, here's how much it is. And here's where you can send the payment. We got it taken care of right like that. Cause I just, they're not, it's not as, as big of a deal as everyone thinks it is. And that one there is one that I've had the uh, authorization on file for a long time and they keep losing it. And so I just had to redo it again with them, but I did it after the fact. All right, who's next? Uh, yeah, so if I'm rehabbing, um, that, that actually it's even more important, rehabbing properties, because you're going to be, when you're rehabbing properties, you still want the property to be in the trust, because you're now going to be in the chain of title. So if there's a problem later on, uh, let's say, oh, um, a, uh, a good example would be, you did a renovation on a property, and you installed a new refrigerator, and the water leaked in the refrigerator. Right. Well, somebody, everyone's going to go after everybody after that. Well, who do you think they're going to go after? The previous owner. Well, if they the, if they look on the public records and they find the previous owner was a trust, who are they going to go after? Nobody. But if the previous owner was you or your company, they know who to go after. And if it's a company and you're a rehabber, they're they're assuming you made a lot of money on this deal. So I mean, you made a loss money, but they're assuming you made a lot of money. So they're going to go after you. So I don't I don't want to ever be in the chain of title because they're going to go up the chain of title until they find the deepest pockets. And I don't want to be the one with the deepest pockets. Or at least I don't want to be the one that they find with the deepest pockets. Okay, so what if you're the property's in your name right now and you transfer it into a trust? Can people find that if they did an asset search? I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, Mike. Uh, if, you, if they did an asset search, can they still find you? An asset search, no. Because when, when they're doing an asset search, what they're looking for is who owns, what does that person or that entity own right now? So they go on public records and they do that quick search. If they went down and they did a title search on that property, then yes. They're going to see if they did an actual title policy, a title search on a specific property, you will show up in that. But if they just did a search on your name, it's not going to, it'll show up as if you sold it to somebody else and you no longer own it. That's what it's going to appear to the rest of the world. You know, I'm starting to get into a few of these questions that I know I've already answered because I ran S way earlier. So Andrea is asking questions about uh, passive versus active, which how would anyone know? I think I've already answered that one, but she's already gone. How much the cost to set up a trust? If you're going to do it yourself, nothing, just your education to learn how to do it. If you hire somebody, I, I mean, I charge people, depending on the trust, I, I'm charging $2,000 right now just to create a trust for people. Where, and all I'm gonna do is the paperwork and I do that and I charge that kind of money because I don't wanna do them. So I've been charging that to get people to not even ask me anymore. I would rather have you pay me $500 and take one of my classes to learn it than pay me 2000. But if you wanna pay me 2000, I'll do the paperwork for you. And the reason why I do charge a, a lot, one, I don't want to do it. So if you're willing to pay it, I'll do it. But two, I found the people who are not willing to do it themselves and want me to do it are the ones that waste more of my time because now they got umpteen million questions and those questions are gonna go on for two years. So I wanna get paid now for the, the amount of time and work I know I'm gonna have to put in for the next year or two while you're still learning this whole process. Right? But I find the people who are willing to learn them themselves, pay the for the course, they're, they're the ones that get it. Now, if you do that and you, do, and you run into a situation which does happen and you need help and some advice on it, I'm there for you whether you did the course or, or you pay me to do it for you. Either way, I'm going to be there for you guys.
can you, I think she was asking, can you pay a trust trustee? Yeah, I think I got all those already. Yeah, Jack was saying she just sold one out of a trust and the mortgage company said they would only write the check to the trust name or the LLC that was a trustee. And that's what I was saying. That's why you want to have that long name that's going to be like the property address and then your trustee and then the title companies, it's a lot easier for them to understand that they have to write the check to the trustee, not to the trust because we don't have checking accounts because it's a, um, because it's a flow through entity. There's no checking account. That's the problem with it. And if they wrote it out to the trust, now I have to go and get a checking account, which means I now have to open up an EIN, which now means I'm going to have to file a tax return on that and then dissolve that, close out that tax, uh, that, that entity later on. I don't want to go through all that hassle when the IRS doesn't even require it. So by doing it this way, it makes it easier and then they, they can write it out to the trustee. Now, here's, and this is something we also talk about in our advanced training class that I do is um, if you're not going to be your own trustee, that's one of the reasons why I want to have my own entity being the trustee as well. Uh, because years ago, I was a trustee for a gentleman. He bought a property and I, I want to say I was a trustee for tw 10, 12 years for him on that one. And he bought it dirt cheap, uh, did a kick-ass rehab on the property and then rented it out and then rented it out for about eight or 10 years or whatever and then got the property back and then did another kick-ass rehab on the property and then sold it but it went from like I think he bought it for maybe 50 grand back in the day in the meantime those two rehabs he probably put another seventy thousand dollars into them because back then you know Twenty or thirty thousand dollar rehab back then it was about the same as a seventy now. So maybe he didn't even have fifty thousand dollars. So he maybe had a hundred into the whole thing entirely. He sold it for four hundred thousand dollars, free and clear. I was the trustee on it that whole time, and the title company would only write the check out to me. So can you imagine his fear that the title company had to write the check out to me? I mean, I had to put it in my my checking account because it's a business entity. You can't even, you know, pay to the order of and sign it over to them. I had to go into my account, and then you had to wait the seven, six or seven days for it to clear my account. A four hundred thousand dollar check, free and clear, and property, no mortgage, or nothing, and then I had to write him that check. So can you imagine his fear and concern for that week while he was waiting for the funds to clear, and then to get back to him? So that's why you want to be able to um, be your own trustee. And have it your own company. Those are the types of things we talk about in that class. Uh, I was looking at doing a HELOC and a mortgage combined. Can you do? Can you also have the property to trust? Um, technically, yes, you can. Um, but I will tell you from a practical standpoint, it's not that easy to work with the lenders. Um, and I am going through that right now. I'm actually I got one of my properties, right? I have a really small balance on it, on one of my rentals, and I'm refinancing it right now. And I'm taking it out of my name and I'm or out of the trust and I'm putting it into my personal name to get the HELOC and then pay off the underlying mortgage. And then I'm going to put it back into the trust right after. Um, I could do it the other way. It's just going to cost a lot more money, a little bit higher interest rate, and the, the lender is a little bit more nervous about it, but they have no problem with us doing this all at one time. Taking out of trust, out of the trust into my name at the time of the closing, and they're going to be doing the HELOC and then pay off my underlying mortgage that's on there because the underlying mortgage is in my name, but the property is not. So they want to pay off. They want that all to match up when they're doing it all at the same time. So I'm like, okay, we'll just do it. And that gets back to, again, I was saying earlier, this is how I want to do everything, but when it gets right down to it, to, you know, to 
to the the brass knuckles is what's it going to take to make it work and then we just do it in this case i'm taking it out put it in my name i'll do the refinance pay off that underlying and now i'm going to have a probably a two hundred thousand dollar heloc to play with because that's what i've been saving this property up for and paying it down on it so i'd have it i know the time's right i want that cash available because once we come on the back side of this thing I will, I want to be the one that's being able to write the checks for the properties or have the down payments, pick up the sub twos, all that. I want to be the finance guy of last resort for everyone else. So that's what I'm setting up right now. And I will put it in my own name and then put it back in. And that is very common that investors have to take them out of the, the trust, refinance, and then put them back in. <clears throat> Uh, I do not have a higher insurance on my vehicle because as far as the lender is concerned or the insurance company is concerned, I'm the owner. So they're in my name and I have had conversations with them and they're like, yeah, we don't care as long as, as long as you can prove to us at the time, if we have to pay out a claim that you're the beneficiary, as long as that's the case and it's not any company or anything like that. Now that's what my, my company has said. Uh, and I've had, uh, I did have to make a claim on my truck it was in a, Actually, it was Geico. My truck was sitting in my driver in my parking in my in my driveway at 5 a.m. Somebody came off the main road and smacked in the back of my truck. Uh, and it was Geico properties in the trust. They never even asked for that. I would imagine they would have if they had a total it out. It wasn't a total. It was just like just some body damage on the back of the vehicle. Uh, but they didn't. I, they never said anything about that. But my current insurance company. They know that I got the property in the trust, at least the agent knows. And it's like, yeah, we don't care. People do that all the time. It's a revocable trust. This is not an irrevocable. So an irrevocable trust would be a, a living trust where those are irre irrevocable. Uh, and, and that's why they have such high liability protections. Our trusts are revocable. So as long as it's a revocable trust means we can revoke it at any time. I can take the property out of the trust and put it in my own name at any time I want to. Whereas an irrevocable trust, we couldn't do that. Once it's in there, it's in there until some some circumstances happen that the either they, they sell the property or it's you know, the person dies and it gets automatically transferred to somebody else or whatever. 